Hi, everybody. It is Jeff. Well, this is going to be a very somber uh, kind of uh, uh, video here um, because today it was announced that uh, DC Fontana had passed away yesterday, um, which was December the 2nd. And uh, there wasn't, there's no details at the time I'm recording this, there wasn't any details yet about the uh, situation that happened to her. I don't know if she was suffering with any illnesses or anything like that, um, but. Uh, she passed away she was 80 years old um, so she she had a full life you know um, and uh, she did so much work uh, for television and and stuff in her career that I mean my god I mean she's contributed tons of material for different TV shows and books um, uh, it's just it's amazing I mean I mean you can go to Wikipedia and just type in DC Fontana and read uh, about her and it's there's a lot there um, but she she really uh, you know she worked a lot with Gene Roddenberry for you know I guess she met him when he was they were doing the series the lieutenant and uh, and then after uh, the show ended um, she followed him over to uh, Star Trek and uh, she had been working with him for, she made what, I think there was like uh, 10 episodes, I think, of her uh, uh, working with, um, with him on, uh, on Star Trek. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, she, uh, she wrote for like uh, the episode, of, let's see if I can, the name of the episode she worked on were uh, Charlie X, which she originally titled the day Charlie became God okay and she gave him the story credit uh, even though she reworked it and took the teleplay credit for herself um, she did work on it and it became the second episode to the original Star Trek original series <clears throat> Um, she worked on Tomorrow Was Yesterday, which was her idea. She came up with that idea. Um, and then she worked on This Side of Paradise. Um, remember the, the plants there that would shoot stuff there at you and stuff? I mean, that was a... She had to rewrite that story, I guess, um, for the show. And, uh, and she came up with ideas for the episode's Journey to Babel which was a good episode because we get to see uh, Spock's father and mother and Friday's child, which was pretty good, you know, because uh, that was, uh, that's one where uh, uh, McCoy delivered uh, a baby there <laughs> in that episode. And, um, and we see the Enterprise fighting a dot <laughs> on the view screen. <laughs> uh, but it was a good episode nonetheless. I mean, it's, it was, you know, uh, then she wrote uh, re she rewrote the whole episode of the ultimate computer um, and uh, That was a good one too because that's where we should see the m5 and we get to see uh, um, You know other starships of course they all look like the Enterprise, but we get to see other starships. I think uh, that many and for the first time um, so <clears throat> That was a good one and then she she was one of four writers to re write Harlan Ellison's The City on the Edge of Forever and I guess that was like an in, a huge insult for for Harlan because he died complaining to his dying with his dying breath about how he got screwed over by Gene Roddenberry and the whole you know thing so his you know instead of chalking it up as a learning experience he just took it as somebody slapping him down because he was too talented or something like that you know that's that's the kind of the swelled ego he had you know, at the time um but still his name was in the credits and you know he can't he can't just say well at least they credited me for it you know or something um so uh in the third season she wasn't she wasn't really working on on Star Trek at that point but she did include uh, she did submit some ideas like the Enterprise incident 
that which survives, the way to Eden. Um, and she had mentioned that uh, she had a problem with how they filmed the Enterprise incident because uh, the cloaking device was too small. And, <laughs> and remember, the cloaking device was a part of the uh, uh, Nomad head, and it had this globe and a bottom uh, piece to attach onto something. Well, yeah, I always thought that looked kind of cheesy, you know, for a cloaking device, you know, because on Deep Space Nine, if you remember, uh, Quark and his brother were hauling around a cloaking device while it was still cloaked, and the thing weighed a ton, it, you know, apparently, and it was pretty big. It was like the size of a twin-size bed, <laughs> you know, almost, you know, so it just, you know, so how they went from this little nomad-looking thing to that, you know, it just, I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, she was right about that. It was, but, of course, budget, you know, that's, that's the whole thing is budgets, you know, dictate what they can do. They just probably took whatever was at hand and just tried to mishmash something together, like the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, Zarkon globe and they put the head of the you know so but uh, she worked on other shows uh, like uh, <coughs> Battlestar Galactica and the Waltons and uh, Buck, uh, Buck Rogers and Logan's Run and she worked on the animated series of Star Trek um, she was actually more more involved with it than Ron Berry was himself because he wasn't the showrunner anymore. Um, but her job was to receive uh, pitch, uh, pitches for the for episodes, um, which she didn't take to Gene and you know and have him look it over or something you know before they put it together. So, um, and you know that 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 series got an award, you know, uh, an outstanding children's series in 1975. They got an Emmy Award for that. So. Uh, that was pretty good, you know, and she, she takes, you know, I don't, I think if she wasn't involved with it, it probably wouldn't have been as great as it was, but it, you know, it worked, worked out pretty well. Um, of course, we all know she worked with Roddenberry on, uh, the Next Generation pr uh, pilot episode, Encounter at Farpoint, and, uh, Her, she had uh, she worked on the Naked Now, but she credited the work to her pseudonym J. Michael Bingham. Um, <laughs> um, and maybe I don't know if you know because you know everybody, most Star Trek Next Generation fans consider that like the worst episode, you know, <laughs> in, in the uh, whole series of uh, episodes they did, and uh, and I think it sort of ruined the character of Wesley Crusher from that point on. Uh, and you know maybe she cha she used her pseudonym for that because she probably knew it wasn't going to be well received or something you know and it, it was kind of an off the wall episode for a second episode i mean i for one thing i remember watching that and i was thinking what are they going to do take like every episode from the original series and just retweak it for next generation because i mean obviously they were borrowing from another you know uh the naked time uh to you know for this episode for next generation and it was like you know it was a bad it was a bad second step i mean they did a good first step with encounter farpoint but the second step was a misstep damn near uh, uh, a stumble you know <laughs> because it really it was really beneath the show in, in a way it was sort of like they couldn't you know maybe they was like throwing something together you know for a second episode because they didn't have enough time or something I don't know it just it felt really rushed and it just uh, it seemed you know the writing just seemed really tacky and you know it was uh, a lot of things about that episode that people would just rather forget you know were in it you know? um, but uh, anyway she probably saw the bullet coming from that one and she changed her her, her uh, name and used a pseudonym for instead for the to get the credit um, which, you know, I think is probably, you know, a good idea as a writer. Um, that way you can protect your, your real identity and only allow them to use it on things that work. So that way your credibility as a writer doesn't get tarnished. Because if you're working for Hollywood and you're trying to submit uh, ideas for, for different TV shows, you don't want anybody to say, oh, I remember her because she, or, uh, 
she wrote that dumb episode in this or something. You know what I'm saying? You don't want to have some baggage brought with you when you're trying to make a living as a writer. So if you have a pseudonym, um, you know, you can use that to pitch things you're not sure of. So that way people won't know, you know, who this is really from or what, what have you, you know. So um, I think for her, it probably helped her career as a writer to to uh, use those pseudonyms um, for different for different shows. Like uh, she, you know, had a problem with working on some TV shows that I'm not going to go into here, but um, but I will say that she worked on popular shows uh, like The Big Valley, um, Bonanza, um, uh, The Streets of San Francisco, that was a pretty good show, uh, Six Million Dollar Man, The Land of the Lost, Kung Fu, uh, Logan's Run, The Waltons, Dallas, uh, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, um, she did one episode of that cartoon. Um, War of the Worlds back in 1989. Uh, she worked on Deep Space Nine, Babylon 5, uh, Earth Final Conflict, which I didn't watch. <laughs> I don't know, it just seemed like it wasn't for me. And she actually uh, wrote an episode for a Star Trek fan film called Star Trek New Voyages. And... Uh, um, it was a story that brought Walter Koenig back into the fold playing uh, Mr. Chekhov again and it's a good it's a, if you can find it on YouTube okay just go on YouTube and type in uh, Star Trek New Voyages and the name of that episode and I forget now but uh, where was that So if you want to find that particular one, let me see here, pause. Yeah, the episode is called To Serve All My Days. Uh, she wrote the episode, um, the whole thing, I guess. So there was no assistant writers, there was no rewrites. She just wrote the whole thing. And it's based a little bit on the episode, The Enterprise Incident from TOS. Uh, so, um, it's very well done. I recommend, if you haven't seen it, please watch it. Uh, it's good to see Walter Koenig back involved with, uh, with Star Trek again. Um, and it's, it's really good. It's on, it's on YouTube. Just type it in, Star Trek New Voyages to Serve All My Days. Um, but, you know, she's, she's done a lot for Star Trek. Uh, a lot of work. I mean, and, and, and it largely goes uh, unrecognized by many fans because, you know, there's so many different writers in Star Trek that it's hard to keep track of who's writing for what. And, you know, it's, uh, how can I say it? She's been with it so long that she could almost consider herself like a, a go-to person if you're trying to do a Star Trek series, okay? And for some reason or other, uh, Star Trek Discovery, I don't think they ever went to her or asked her to do or asked her to contribute anything or any ideas on how to do that show. And that would be a mistake because if I was to, you know, if I was to uh, write a Star Trek series or to, to do a Star Trek series, I would want to have around me all the people that I could get my hands on who actually worked on previous versions of Star Trek down through the years and I think it would be ridiculous not to ask them because you know, if you want to make sure that your your ship is being steered straight and you know when you're on course these people have got to be there to consult with you you got to you got to ask them you know is this something Star Trek you know or is this something we can do here for Star Trek and if the, if you have like an idea or something and you don't know how to present it in a Star Trek way uh, these people can actually figure that out how you know how you can do it and um, you know for her to have been doing Star Trek stories and all that you know right up until you know the early 2000s uh, she obviously was a great resource really for anybody that wanted to jump into that endeavor you know and I I'm surprised that you know 
you know, we don't hear anything. We never heard anything about her being consulted for any of these, uh, you know, these things like Star Trek Discovery. Um, but, you know, there's still a lot of writers out there and a lot of people to this day who worked on, you know, the original series or even Next Generation and probably people who worked with Rodberry and would know, you know, uh, whether their ideas will work. But I think a lot of these people, they don't, you know, like Rick Berman, I, I think they would just rather stay in the background. I, I don't know whether or not they really have any interest in voicing any idea or something like that or any anything. They just would rather, you know, see the show change than actually stand in the way of it, you know, and say, look, it's got to stay like this, you know, for this to make sense to Star Trek fans, you know, or to, to fit within Roddenberry's vision, you know. Um, so, you know, I, I just feel like, uh, you know, it's, it's really incumbent on people these days, especially new people coming into Hollywood now, like directors and writers and stuff like that, that if they're going to do reboots or remakes or whatever have you, um, you can't really do that without consulting with the original people behind it. And uh, that's why I'm, I'm glad in a way that Harv Bennett was consulted. They're doing a six million dollar man movie uh, and Harv Bennett actually worked on the original uh, Six Million Dollar Man. So it'll be interesting to see how that movie's going to be. Um, but at least they can, they, he's involved with it. So at least, you know, in that way, I'm, I'm more, uh, I feel more safe that the movie might be, might live up to uh, the style and, and the, and the uh, quality of what we saw on television. Of course, I mean, Harv Bennett being a TV, a long, kind uh, time TV guy he also worked on the Star Trek movies um, he didn't think much of Star Trek the motion picture but his hands were deeply involved with Star Trek 2 and and on so uh, you know the success of the of that film uh, franchise you know you know uh, rested a lot on him because uh, I don't think Gene Roddenberry was really too involved with the movies itself except for the first one but uh, um, I'm not saying he wasn't involved, but you know, uh, I think ultimately the, uh, you know, the stories and all that, you know, came from other people, um, and he just either gave a thumbs up or a thumbs down to it. Um, sometimes I think even if he didn't approve it, it still got made, like uh, Star Trek V. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, with the Six Million Dollar Man and and Harv Bennett, he, he really. He really did well on that show, so I'm hoping that this movie will live up to to what his TV show was. Um, anyway, Mark Wahlberg is going to play uh, Steve Austin in it, um, and he's a he's a good actor. I like him. I've seen him in a lot of different things, so it'll be interesting to see him play Steve Austin. Um, everybody's hoping that there'll be a Jamie Summers in there for a Bionic Woman, um, and in today's Hollywood, I guess it would almost be a must, <laughs> you know. If you don't put Bionic Woman in there, everyone's going to be trashing it till hell freezes over, you know. If they don't have him in, or have her, uh, her in there, the character. So, but <clears throat> yeah, to to go back with uh, with DC Fontana, it's it's really a sombering day, you know. Um, of course, we've lost a lot of uh, Star Trek um, alumni over the years recently, and uh, you know, it's that thing about life, you know. We're just passing through. You know, our time here is is finite, and we we try to make our mark in the world so we're never forgotten. And I think really that's all we can ever hope to do is is to. Uh, it's not so much about accumulating wealth and merchandise and power. It's about what we leave behind. You know, for positive or negative. You know, um, it defines who we are. Um, when you leave something good behind. Uh, people will always remember that and they'll remember you and you'll live on in that way and I think with with DC Fontana you know she's gonna be remembered for a long time um, her work is always gonna be out there you know in, in book form or television form and all the reruns and stuff people are always gonna see uh, her name or her pseudonym <laughs> in uh, whatever's there so you know she's she's given her you know her bit to uh, Hollywood and uh, you know I give all my condolences and sympathies to her family and friends and uh, you know I hope that they re remember that there's a lot of people out there that that uh, 
really care about uh, her work and uh, respect her for the things that she's done uh, for different shows and, and especially Star Trek. And, uh, uh, you know, I just, uh, it's tough to, to chew, you know, to uh, go through, you know, a, a death in a family and stuff. I've gone through it, you know, different times, but um, it takes time to, to get through it. And uh, maybe, maybe getting online and, and reading some of the feedback from, from people uh, who might say something, you know, in a comment about her or something in the, in the, because I know there's different websites that are probably talking about this too. So, you know, they see that it, it might make them feel a little bit better that, you know, that she was respected for, for her work. So <coughs> anyway, if you have a, a comment you want to leave below or something to say uh, to, uh, to her family, uh, please go ahead and do so. Um, I know YouTube is a, is a big place where people like to go to, to see and, uh, you know, and read different things. And uh, I will come back with uh, something else to talk about, and I will see you at that time. So take care, everybody.